afternoon and thank you for joining us for our webinar on multifamily investing with our guest, Ivan Madrigal. My name is Larissa. I'm with Advana IRA, and I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about self-directed IRAs, and then we're going to bring Ivan on to answer the questions um, that were sent over to us when we um, requested them during the last 30 days. If you didn't have a chance to get your question in, that's okay. We're going to take questions during the webinar as well. I am going to keep everybody on mute for the purpose of the recording, but you're welcome to type your questions into the question box, and we'll get those answered. We're going to take questions throughout, so if you if something comes up and or you have a question on something that Ivan is speaking on, please feel free to get your questions in the chat box and I'll go ahead and get them answered for you. Uh, like I said, my name is Larissa. I've been with Advana IRA for um, a little over seven years now. And my role here is business development and education. So I do a lot of seminars and webinars here at Advanta and all of our seminars are strictly educational. And so if you're just getting started with a self-directed IRA or you're a seasoned investor, you're always welcome to join us for our seminars. There's always no cost, no obligation, and we always have something going on. So, you know, we've had a lot of requests, a lot of questions on multifamily investing. So we asked Ivan to join us and help us get those questions answered. But here at Advana IRA, what we handle specifically is self-directed retirement accounts. So what that means is that we hold the account, you find the investment, and we help you get it in the name of the IRA. And then from there, the IRA is going to receive all of the income for that investment. And we're located in Largo, Florida. We also have an office in Atlanta, Georgia, but we can help anybody anywhere. So we have clients nationwide and even worldwide, and they're invested worldwide. So I have clients invested in property, for example, in Costa Rica. I have clients that have investments in China. And so really, there are some rules for self-directed IRAs, but just keep in mind, the sky is just about the limit when you're talking about a self-directed IRA. And what we provide here, again, is a service. And what we do is a little bit different from our competitors where you would receive an account manager with Advanta. That person is available to answer your questions by email or phone. And so having one point of contact really helps you to get those investments done on a timely manner, which I know when you're investing outside of the market is very important because at times you're meeting with somebody and, and doing a handshake deal over coffee, you want to make sure that it gets funded in time, um, you know, and properly. So that's what we're here to help you with. We talk a lot at Advanta IRA about the rules for self-directing retirement accounts. And so that's very important, understanding the rules, knowing what you can and can't do. And we're really not going to go into it too much on this webinar. I don't want to take up too much time. I want Ivan to have plenty of time to answer questions. But what we don't do is we don't give legal tax or investment advice. And so that's very important because we're not going to do due diligence for you or approve any investment outside of telling you whether or not it's allowed within IRS rules. But if you are looking to have those questions answered, let me know, and I can put you in touch with a professional that can help you with that. Many people have not heard about self-directed IRAs just very simply because many administrators don't allow them. So although they've actually always been allowed since IRAs were created in 1974, brokerage firms aren't willing to hold what they consider hard to value assets. So, you know, things like uh, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds are easy to value. They can hold those very easily. And so that's kind of what they do. And then what we do is fill the gap in the industry for those um, self-directed types of investments that are less common, um, less commonly known, and also, you know, not available on the market. So I'll talk very briefly about the different types of investments we see within a self-directed IRA. But just so you're aware, brokerage firms are typically not willing to hold these. And so we hold things like private stock and real estate. And again, just there's just so many types of investments that are considered maybe less common, but are allowed by IRS rules. And self-directed IRA is really the, the types of investments that are um, that make up those types of accounts make up for less than 4% of all investments in retirement accounts. And so that includes things like pension plans and 401ks, any type of employer plan, really. Um, when we're talking about self-directed IRAs, a lot of times we're talking to people who are looking to use IRA funds of their own to make investments outside of the market. But I always like to remind people, keep self-directed IRAs in mind as a tool in your tool belt, because if you're working on 
um, maybe doing a syndication for something like multifamily investments and mobile home parks. It's something to keep in mind for your investors. So we've seen a lot of times where people are doing a syndication and they're raising capital for these types of investments just by approaching their current investors and letting them know that they can invest by using a retirement account, they'll have repeat investors. So people are able to make those investments um, with retirement accounts. They really just simply weren't aware that they could do that. And so with accessibility of those retirement accounts, they're able to reinvest, make you know a bigger investment than they were originally planning. Many people don't know that they can use retirement funds before the IRS considered retirement age of 59 and a half, so they assume that they have to wait until 59 and a half in order to use those funds to make these types of investments, and the truth is you can do it at any time. So the purpose of your retirement account is very simply to grow it and save it for retirement, but you can do that with investing into something like a multifamily property or real estate really of any kind, and so having access to that account really helps you diversify your portfolio. A lot of times there's better returns in a self-directed IRA, so something like a money market account or a CD with a bank. Returns, as everybody knows at this time, are pretty low, but being able to self-direct and find the investment that you want, you really are at, you know, having the ability to make investments and determine the rate at which your IRA is going to grow. So, you know, when I talk about the types of investments a couple slides from now, you're going to see that, you know, something like private lending, for example, you get to set the rate at which you're willing to lend at. And so if you want 6%, 7%, 8%, 10%, then you're basically going to go out and find a borrower willing to pay those terms. And now you know how your IRA is going to grow and at what rate. There's also no outside approval needed for a self-directed IRA. So again, as long as you're investing within the rules, then that is definitely something you can do with a self-directed IRA. And we're not going to tell you yes or no, you can't make this investment. As long as it's allowed by IRS, then you're going to be able to make that investment with your retirement account. And so when we talk about self-direction, we are truly talking about self-directing that account. Um, I have up here the list of different self-directed plans, and I like to go over this quickly because a lot of times people think that if they don't have a Roth IRA, they can't self-direct it. I'm really not sure where that came from, but that's one of the biggest questions I get all the time is, well, I don't want to switch to a Roth IRA because I don't want to pay the taxes, so I guess that means that I'm not going to be able to self-direct the account. And the truth is, and you can see that here on my slide, if it ends in IRA, it can be self-directed. So traditional and Roth are, of course, the most common types of accounts. Then you have your employer-based plans like a simple IRA or a SEP IRA, a solo or 401k plan for an individual, but also any type of employer plan once you've severed ties with that employer. So if you're not participating in that plan anymore, a four, oh, um, excuse me, a 401k, a 403B, a 457 plan, all of those types of plans can be self-directed by very simply rolling them over to the corresponding IRA. So if it's a pre-tax plan, it would go to a pre-tax account like a traditional IRA, and then you're ready to self-direct that account. You also, it's not an all or nothing strategy, so you also don't have to move over the entire account. You can move over just what you want to self-direct. And so if you have an investment idea or plan coming up, and it's $100,000, you can move over just $100,000 and leave the remaining amount with your brokerage firm. And so again, diversifying your portfolio. I also have up here on my slide, education savings accounts and health savings accounts. And although they are not retirement plans, the rules for self-directing these accounts are gonna be exactly the same. And so we can help you with those. We can act as your third party administrator, help you set up that account, and then you can go out and find those um, private investments that you wanna make through these plans. I think the biggest question I get with the health savings account is how do you know if you qualify? You're gonna to have to go to your healthcare provider and find out if the plan that you're enrolled in allows you to make health savings account contributions. It's unfortunately not a way to um, self-insure. You do have to have a plan and the plan has to allow those contributions. But if your plan right now doesn't allow it, that's something to keep in mind for when you're um, shopping your plan next year. 
So again, the IRS hasn't given us a list of things that we can invest in. And what they do instead is give you a list of things you can't do. And that list is very short. Very simply, life insurance and collectibles. Those are the only two asset classes you cannot invest in with a self-directed IRA. And so as I mentioned earlier, you can see why really the sky is the limit for a self-directed IRA. And so I just like to give everybody an idea of what it is that we see here at Advanta for self-directed IRAs. And real estate is the most common investment we see, and that's real estate in so many different forms. And it makes up about 30% of the assets we hold here at Advanta. And we have a little over a billion under management. So that's a lot of real estate-based investments. When we see commercial property, um, a lot of times commercial property will be um, through partnerships or syndications where people are putting money together to make those investments. We also see people rehabbing properties. And it's important to realize that you're not required to hold the property for any certain amount of time in an IRA. So because the IRA does not pay capital gains, you don't have to hold the investment for a year and a day to, um, you know, when you're looking at short-term versus long-term capital gains. And so we do see people rehabbing properties. Residential property of any kind, you can buy three twos if you want, condos, duplexes, hold those properties for long-term, short-term. Um, they can be vacation rentals, whatever it is that you're comfortable with in your retirement account, you can do that. We also have many people who are not interested in tenants, termites, and toilets in their IRA account. And so rather than buy and hold a property, they might invest in something like mortgages. So actually being the bank with your IRA account. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you get to determine the rate at which you're willing to lend and therefore where your IRA will grow. And so if you want to lend, a, uh, lend money on a property, whether it's short term, like a year to a rehabber, or if it's long term, 15 to 30 years, that is completely up to you. I also see people invest in things like tax liens and unsecured notes. And a lot of times people will say, you know, why would anybody lend unsecured? But, you know, remember, the greater the risk, the greater the reward. And so that might not be something you or I are comfortable with, but many people invest into unsecured notes. And they might be to a business rather to an individual, but again, the structure is completely up to you. We see debenture notes, option contracts in real estate, assignments, joint venturing, something very common. So if you're not familiar with joint venturing, that's lending money, maybe at some interest rate, but then also getting a piece of the upside when that property sells. I've also seen people invest in things like accounts receivable, or receivable so buying debt in a self-directed retirement account. The other alternative assets that we see pretty commonly are gonna be things like LLCs. Sometimes that's for checkbook control, and if you're not familiar with checkbook control, we have a webinar that we do on using an LLC or a trust to gain checkbook control of your IRA, and that's something pretty common. There are some rules involved with that, so make sure to check out our YouTube channel and check out our checkbook control webinar. It's a good one. We also see less common things like farm animals. I've had clients invest in things like cattle, racehorses, alpaca. I had a client buy um, hogs a couple weeks ago. So again, keeping in mind that, you know, invest in what you know best. And we have many people that are very familiar with real estate, but there are other people who are not, and they want to make their investments with their retirement account and something that they know how to analyze. I've also seen clients invest in things like movie projects, precious metals, and we're talking here about gold and silver bars and coins, uh, platinum, palladium. So as long as it's the value of that precious metal is not based on it being um, rare, but rather what it's being traded at market value, that would work. We've also seen people do equipment leasing, foreign currency exchange, and cryptocurrency. Something more common would be something like private stock, commodities, and oil and gas. So that really just kind of gives you an idea of what we're seeing people here at Advanta invest into. And so again, just a reminder, if you have any questions, make sure you type them into the question box and we will get them answered. I did see a question pop up here. I see it's on multifamily. So I'm gonna hold off on getting that answered for now and we'll um, get to Ivan and then we'll go back to that question. So really quickly, I just wanna introduce Ivan Madrigal. He's the president of Asset Legacy Group. He invests in multifamily residential property and mobile home parks. How are you doing today, Ivan? Fantastic, Larissa. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for joining us. And with that, I'll let you go ahead and take control. 
fantastic. Thank you so much. Actually, the pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me here, uh, educating your uh, your audience. Um, so, let me see if I can get this to work here. All right, perfect. So, I'm Ivan Madrigal. I'm the uh, president and founder of uh, Asset Legacy Group. And uh, as Larissa mentioned, we focus on multifamily investing and uh, mobile home parks, primarily in Georgia, in uh, Flo Florida and Georgia. And, you know, we go from primary, secondary, and tertiary markets. Uh, we look at uh, all of them, um, depending on the asset. So I'm also the host of uh, Wealth and Passive Income uh, through Multifamily Investing. It's a meetup that we hold monthly in Clearwater. A lot of uh, educational materials uh, there as well. And uh, before becoming uh, a real estate entrepreneur, I had a very successful career in banking. Uh, that's uh, where my, uh, my entrepreneurial spirit actually was developed. And um, you know, I went from being a, a banker, <clears throat> a chase to being a, a, an investment banker, to being a relationship manager uh, for the business side of it, and, um, and being a branch manager as well um, for the local banks. So enough about me on that. Just wanted you to have a little bit of my background. And make sure I didn't go too far. Okay, so all great questions that, that were sent. And I um, want to start with uh, what are the risks of multifamily investing? So there's a lot of risk in everything. I mean, any, any, any investment, uh, as you all know, involves risk. However, um, I found that real estate is probably the one that that carries a little bit less risk uh, than investing into the you know stock market or something like that. Um, and if you concentrate on multifamily and commercial assets, uh, mobile home parks or whatnot, it's even uh, even better. So some of the things that you have to be careful in those in, in, in regards to multifamily investing and uh, and really any commercial uh, property uh, for that matter is not doing proper due diligence. Uh, that is uh, a must, and, and there's a long list uh, that you have to follow because uh, I see time after time investors making that mistake. They they don't do due diligence, and then um, after the closing, they find out you know a bunch of stuff that could be wrong with the property, you know, a bunch of numbers that uh, owners uh, don't disclose. So do uh, do a due diligence and, and never neglect that part. Um, hiring the incorrect property management company. Um, you have to make sure that the, the property management company, if you're going to hire one, aligns with the type of asset that you are purchasing. Uh, all property management companies are, are, are different, and um, you want to make sure that they specialize on, on the size and the asset class uh, that, you're, that you're buying. Um, and a stress testing, something that uh, I've seen happening uh, as well. Uh, people don't stress test they, they, their, their deal. You know, they, they buy multifamily. Uh, properties and and they don't take into consideration uh, a catastrophic event or you know or, or or a market turn something like we had back in 2008. You have to make sure that you're stress testing that deal to the vacancy ratio that you could still make it work. So particularly what that means is what uh, occupational uh, occupation ratio do you need to pay the bills, even if you don't have to. If, if you can't pay yourself anything, but at least to pay the operational expenses of the deal and to pay the debt on it. Very important. So if you're buying something and you know that below a 5% vacancy, you'll be negative in cash flow, well, you better think about it twice. So um, that's one of the mistakes that, or one of the risks that, that I see in, in multifamily investing. <clears throat> Benefits of multifamily investing, well, inflation hedge. And um, as the economies expand and, and inflation develop, one of the things that you do uh, uh, as an operator in multifamily is you pass that cost of inflation to your tenants. So everybody knows if you own any real estate that nobody's paying rent uh, in apartment uh, today or mobile home parks that they were paying uh, 10 years ago. It's, it's a lot higher. And that's inflation. So that's one of, that's one of, the, of the great benefits of multifamily investing. Um, cash flow, of course, that's the main reason uh, why we invest in multifamily is because of the the money that that is left, what, what we call the free cash flow, which is everything after you pay all your operational expenses and you pay all your debt. That money goes back to our pockets. In 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 our case, it goes back to our investors, the majority of it. Um, so 
that's the main reason why we invest in real in, in multifamily real estate. Uh, low volatility, of course. There's not um, the, the, it's not like the stock market where you have a bunch of computers and you have a lot of uh, murky trading and, and algorithmic trading going around. Or you, you don't you don't buy multifamily property and and, and and sell it next day or next week. So the volatility it's uh, it's, it's very low, and um, and of course that makes you sleep at night. I think a little bit better than than seeing the way the market behaves nowadays. Um, and tax advantages is another one. With that is something that I always refer back to your CPA, your attorney, or refer back to you know whoever is your tax uh, advisor. But there is a lot of uh, advantages on, on on multifamily properties because of something that's called cost segregation. Um, it's complex. You have to have someone do it, and, and someone professional that knows how to do it. But the, in essence, the um, the asset gets um, blank here for a minute. The asset gets depreciated at different levels. So the the building itself itself gets depreciated, but the floors have different depreciation uh, as well. You know the the refrigerators. Um, you know the sinks. I mean everything. You segregate that cost. And uh, it could be a, a potential, potentially a very big impact on uh, on taxes. So that's another reason why we really like multifamily investing. All right. So, what percentage of gross rents should be allocated for expenses? Um, all right. So, maintenance, fees, dues, debt service, things like that. So, typically between forty and fifty percent is allocated to Repairs and maintenance, property management, taxes, insurance, make ready, which is pretty much uh, after you have a, a tenant uh, leave, you have to make that unit ready again to be uh, leased back up. Uh, payroll and everything else you can think of. Debt service is after those expenses. So typically, we see right off the top, the, the right off our uh, potential gross income, you see 40 to 50 percent expenses in all those areas and then you have the debt to service then after that is it's 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 your your free cash flow pretty much <clears throat> let me know if i'm going too fast here larissa no you're great and actually i have a question um that kind of ties in with that if you were going to so, so you said after that you have free cash flow do you set aside some amount maybe per door just in case you know there's some unforeseen expense or some percentage how do you kind of figure out what you might you know say all of a sudden there's a plumbing leak and you know yes. there's an emergency or something like that how do you figure out what you're going to set aside well the, the the first thing is every time we go into a deal we during our our uh, analysis of the property we usually have what well, we always have a reserve account for for the operations of the uh, of the of the building, and it's and it's based in in, in several different metrics or whatnot. So it, it's not a set amount that we that we that we leave aside. Um, also, you know, purchase price and and what it takes to run the property on a monthly basis. Besides that, um, we leave about two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars per unit per door. For capital reserve, for, for capital expenditures, and that's also included into that 40 to 50 percent that you see they are allocated um, for expenses. So all of that is it's it's there. Um, and besides that, we don't we don't have any more reserve. As long as you do between 250 and 300 dollars per door per year, you should be okay. And of course, having those three, four. You know, maybe even six months of operational expenses set aside in, in an account, just like any other business. Multifamily is just like any other business. You have to have um, a reserve account to operate it for unforeseen uh, events. So that's how we do it. Okay. On the, okay. Thank you. Yeah. And on the mobile home parks, a little bit different, but since we're not talking about mobile home parks today. I'm going to stick to multifamily. Right. All right. So what percentage? makes the investment not feasible. So there's no specific percentage that um, that, that makes it not make sense. Uh, there, there, there's variables in the way a property is operated. So 
I, I would always say pay attention to why the expenses are so high. If you see anything over 50%, uh, really take a deep look into it because that could be an opportunity. You know, they, not everybody runs, everybody operates property uh, differently. And uh, that's, that's actually how we uh, come in and take advantage of having a good deal on our table. And, and, and nowadays there's, there's a lot more operators that are very effective on, on running the properties, but we still come across people that don't, are not as effective um, especially if, you know, if, if, if they haven't progressed with technologies and things like that, that, you know, you, you could see very high expenses, uh, and that could be an opportunity. So I would say just dig deeper and find out the facts on, on why it's, uh, it, are the expenses so high and see if there is a way to improve them. I mean, if it's something completely wrong, physically wrong with the property, then that's a different, you know, that of course you have to make a judgment call there. But, uh, but a lot of times it's actually an opportunity when you see expenses, when you're on the right in the deal, expenses over 50%, that could be an opportunity. So keep that in mind there. So when you initially purchase a multifamily property, what improvements do you normally do immediately to add value and raise rents? So the most, Common things that we tackle immediately are the common areas, uh, landscaping, paint, things like that. Th those are the uh, the ones that are faster and and um, cheaper also to uh, to get done, <clears throat> and, and it adds value. As, as soon as you raise rents, but but the tenants see that now you know you took away um, uh, your the, the, the bikes that were lying around or the bikes that were actually leaning against the columns and you, you start enforcing the rules and you start making everything look cleaner and nicer in the, in the common areas. Uh, you start taking care of a landscaping, you put some mulch on the, uh, on the gardens, you, you, uh, you put a fresh coat of paint on the building, um, you put a fresh coat of uh, pavement on the parking lot. That makes a huge difference on the, on the, uh, on the, on the property itself and the way it looks. So curb appeal, uh, common areas, that those are, great ways to not do much more do it very they're very easy to do not not require a lot of capital uh, expenses and it will allow you to add value and raise rents now besides that of course <clears throat> excuse me you could always um, improve the units um, and, and transition those units uh, into a much nicer looking units and, and demand premium for those. So I believe there's a question around that further up in the uh, in the deck here. So I'm going to hold on and see if it comes up. So how are rents decided when you take control of the properties? It's mainly dictated by the market. Uh, that's for the most part. Um, you could transition a, a property from a, a C class to a B class if you do internal uh, renovations of the, of the units. And of course, if it's in a market that allows you to do that. Um, in, in Tampa, there are several markets that, that could allow you to do that. You could buy a property in the in a sub market in South Tampa uh, that could be in 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 need of a, of a good rehab, and it's a C class property. But the area it's a demand for a for a B class B class kind of property. So you could do internal renovations, and, and the most common ones today are you know nice backsplash, nice um, fixtures. Um, the vinyl plank flooring, things like that. And that would actually allow you to raise rents dramatically. I mean, it, it depends on how much under market value they are. Um, you have to really do your homework and know your market um, to, because you want to make sure that you don't go above market value either. You want to make sure that you're competitive. You don't want to be the, you don't want to be the, the least expensive. Uh, you don't want to be the most expensive either. You want to make sure that you find that, that good value there. <clears throat> And so I have a question about the um, what, if you do decide to renovate inside the units, would you do that as leases expire, or is there, you know, something that you would do while you still have tenants in each unit? Um, I mean, you know, obviously something easier would be like replacing the appliances, but I mean, if you wanted to go in and do the backsplash, for example, would you wait until you know people move out before moving new tenants in? Yes, we. I mean, it, it depends on. 
how the leases are expiring and if we see we usually want to do the renovations on units on the on the building on the asset between uh the first year the first 18 months you know it depends on how much renovations you need but we want to make sure that we that we do that in the first 18 months because we want to of course turn the property around stabilize it and and, and return the most amount uh, amount of money possible to our investors so some stuff you could do while tenants are there and there are ways to get it done and get it done clean and fast but um some stuff you can't you know if you get a of course like you said appliances if you have to change um fixtures those things could be done while tenant is there you know you, you get their approval and you, you give them notice and, and you get it done if you got to knock down a wall and things like that that's a little more tricky that um usually that it's better to be to get it done while tenants move out does that answer your question yes perfect thank you okay all right so what do you use for online electronic rent payment? So we use building right now. My company uses building, um, and, and you know they, we we send rent reminders. Um, there's online tenant application, late fees, approaching deadlines, uh, tenant evaluation. It's an accounting software. It's great. We we love it and we use it for our for our um, company. The, the, uh, what some of my peers use Propertyware. Uh, I've heard it's uh, it's fantastic as well. Um, it's the same thing they use for online payments. Uh, you know, they even they, some with property where some tenants actually go to the grocery store and they can make payments at the register there at the grocery store. So um, we give our tenants a bank account number as well. If they want to go straight to the bank and make a deposit, they could do that. They, they, it's a deposit only uh, account, and uh, they have to write a slip because we want to make sure that that you know that, that they have all the information of the unit they're paying. Um, so th there's many ways to, uh, to, to collect the rent. We try to send everybody, follow them to the electronic way. We never accept rent, uh, at the office, especially if it's cash. We don't accept any cash whatsoever at any of our properties in any of our offices. If they have cash, well, they have to go buy a money order, uh, at the worst case scenario. Um, and then you know, we, we try to steer them away from that because we don't we don't want to accept payments at the offices, but um, but that's for, for, that's not feasible for everybody. So that's another option you could do. One <clears throat> one thing I highly advise you is to not accept cash unless you are there every day and you're managing the property and the tenants bringing the, the, the money and you have a good way to keep that ledger. And by, by all means, but in our case, it's not a good option. We um, we don't feel comfortable with cash at all. So, um, and that's a good point. So, um, the question that I had pop up earlier was actually about an IRA and investing in multifamily. And so, just to kind of um, add on to that, you know, at Advana, we can't accept cash either. And so, when people ask us about how they can accept the rent for or on behalf of their IRA, we always tell them the checks need to be made out for the IRA. So, if you're making this investment in the IRA account, if the IRA owns it directly without an entity in between like an LLC, then rent payments would be made out to the IRA. And that's, you know, the same policy holds here where we don't accept cash. And so if your tenants need to pay cash and they need to buy a money order and have it made out to the IRA account. Um, and one of the questions that popped up was, what if you make an investment into multifamily with an IRA account, what happens to the rents? Well, they just simply get deposited back to the IRA account. And again, if you use an entity in between like an LLC and that LLC owns the multifamily, then the rent would be deposited to that LLC bank account. It does not have to go directly back to the IRA. It can stay in that LLC account so that, you know, if you needed some operating costs in there, you can do it that way. You're not required to send money back until you dissolve the LLC and liquidate the investment. And then at that time, the money comes back to the IRA. But keep in mind that the investment is for saving for retirement. And so one of the big questions I get is, you know, how do I get income off of it? Personally, if the investment is being made in your IRA account, you cannot earn off it personally. So you cannot pay yourself as a manager or for, um, you know, taking care of the um, property or, or property management or anything like that. So it has to be third party investments for, you know, investment purposes. And so any income 
from an investment on the IRA is going to be deposited back to the IRA ultimately. Yeah, yeah and, and all the investments on uh, on our side gets most of them get ACH to the back to the IRA if, if it has to be uh, actually to any bank account really that our investors uh, desire uh, desire to uh, to send those yield uh, investments or the yield payments to so. Um, Anyway, let's move forward here. <clears throat> I'm coming out of a little bit of a allergies here, so my apologies for the noises I make. Uh, what point do you have on-site property management? So this depends on so many factors. I mean, there's a lot to consider um, to consider to actually have someone on site. So typically, in our model, we don't do property management on site unless it's about 70 doors, 75 doors and up. Um, if you're managing the property yourself and it's a smaller property, let's say 40, 45, 50, you might get away with doing something like that and have someone on site, like a leasing agent, um, you know, not, not a full PM per se, but, but someone that, uh, that could take care of the day to day kind of operations of, of the management operations of, of the property or uh, or you could do it yourself um, but in, in our model we don't typically do anything on site unless it's over 70 doors um, of course if if we buy a property that needs a massive rehab um, it's just a deep value add property then yes you have to have someone there uh, that could coordinate with the with the uh, building crew that, that could coordinate with you know, all the as the units are being uh, remodeled and as the units are transitioning, we could fill up the uh, the building, especially if, if it has high vacancy because of the conditions of the property. So there is a lot of factors that come into play when when you decide to put an on-site property management there. Uh, vacancies have to do with that. Uh, just touching that and and the asset uh, type. So if you have an asset that you know it's 25, 30 doors. But it's an A-class asset in a great neighborhood um, that you know great tenants. That might not really require um, having someone full time there because those those are typically a little bit more sophisticated uh, tenants. You know they they might be more uh, connected with technology, so it'll be a lot easier to manage. If you have an, an asset that is in a C-class area, then you're gonna come across those that want to pay perhaps with. Uh, uh, with a money order and, and the tenant base is a little bit different so you may want to consider having someone there to help you or be there yourself so it all depends on on, on a lot of factors and that and, and please know that multifamily investing there's no a, a, a black and white kind of way to operate your business we look for ways to operate our businesses that are most effective because we have a, a fiduciary responsibility to perform for our investors but if you if you own the property yourself and you're going to manage it yourself you could run it really in any way that you desire as long as it makes you money so on-site management um larissa help me with this question because it's not a question it's just on-site management i think it's really just further um diving into you know on-site management versus outside property management and um you know what what it looks like. And I know you had mentioned that, um, you know, if you have an on-site property manager, there were some other things involved. So, right. Right. So uh, some of the costs associated with on-site management, it's, um, they do have a salary like, like you know, any other uh, property manager. Right. And some, some things that you have to factor in are concessions are, that are given some, some owners like to give their property managers some sort of reduced rent. Um, for being there, um, they give them utilities credit. I mean, you could get very creative uh, with with the on-site management on how you want to compensate them and how you want to structure that part. With somebody that's on-site, are they typically available or on call, so to speak, 24 hours a day, or do you still go with like a um, you know a number for tenants to call? You know, if it's after hours, how does that work? Yeah, we. You never want to have someone twenty four hours on call because that 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 gets very that that gets old pretty quick, and, and it can it can burn out that person. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's a 
on I don't mean to deviate, but, but I'm, it's just kind of inevitable here. On the mobile home part, that's a investment part. It's very common to have an on-site manager. And um, nowadays, we, we're seeing a lot more of a transition to off-site uh, management uh, for mobile home parks because the, the managers get to feel like they never they never leave work. They're always there, right? And uh, and people, when they know who it is, yeah, some people are not really mindful of um, – of, of the fact that it might be eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night, and they knock on people's door, so that's um, you know it's a, there's no there's no right or, or, or wrong way to to do that. That would be pretty much at the, at the discretion of an individual uh, property owner. It really is, uh, but uh, but I will tell you, having someone on site, uh, you have to set clear uh, expectations of what the Hours are, you know, you could you could have a, a small office, a door on the side for for that apartment. I don't know. I, I we really don't have um, that kind of problem. People in multifamily, most on-site management just leave um, after five. You know, they, they they just leave the property. We we don't have anybody that lives in the property uh, in our properties, but it's not something that I haven't heard of. So just because we don't have it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Unfortunately, I can't give you a much better answer than that because I, we don't have that problem. Or, or no, but that's a very good question. point. Um, you know, having, you know, that person work and live on the property would be very difficult. So that's a good point. Yeah. So, so how do you choose property management if there is none in place, right? So experience in the market and, and experience in the particular asset. So there's several types of asset classes. There's A class, uh, B class, C classes, and I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiarized with that, uh, even D. So the property manager has to be familiarized with that asset class. They have to be comfortable with managing a C or a D kind of asset because that's the same kind of clientele that you're going to have there. Um, the size of the property is another factor. You know, if you have, if you're hiring a property manager that has never managed 200 units, but they're more used to medium size, 75, 80, you know, 60s kind of uh, properties. Well, it, 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 that might be uh, a daunting task for them. You know, 200 units is totally different to manage than 75 units uh, because it requires other other people that you have to have there. You have to have maintenance. You get a, you know, maybe you have to have, uh, well, for sure you have to have. Uh, uh, leasing agents and, and perhaps they have to manage that and they don't have the experience of managing other people. So make sure that you um, that you ask the property manager for their experience and the kind of assets that, they're, that they have um, experience in managing, the size, and ask for references. A, lo a lot of times um, uh, property managers, and let me do, let's go back here, a lot of time property managers, uh, if you're doing a transition on a property from asset classes, they have to be comfortable to uh, on doing that transition. They, you have to make sure that they know how to transition an asset from from C to to B. They they have to done it before. This is it, it takes some uh, some knowledge on how to do and how to do it effectively and how to fill up the vacancies. All right. So, what are the pros and cons of hiring someone directly versus hiring a property management company? All right, so again, it goes to your uh, what your level of comfortability is, and it goes to what your objectives are. So if if you want to focus on acquiring more properties and, and increasing your portfolio, I don't think you have time to manage the property yourself because it, 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 it requires a lot of attention. Property management requires a lot of attention. The only reason why we do it in-house in, in is because we have um, people that just do that. I don't get involved in the day-to-day the -day operations of any property. Um, I don't have time for it. My, my, my time is concentrated on acquiring more properties and uh, increasing our portfolio. So make sure that you know your objectives. If it's just that one property, you're not going, you, you don't have any intention of buying another one. You're you're fine with your uh, with your 20 unit building or your or your uh, 40 unit building, and you don't want to buy another one. Let's say that's your retirement, then then fine. You can manage it yourself or hire someone internal to uh, to manage it. Other than that, I would highly advise you to put a property manager in place. Um, 
let's see. The internal property manager, of course, that you know, keeps in mind, keep in mind the, 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 you're responsible for training them, um, taking disciplinary actions, manage the day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, staffing. So that is, it goes back to your objectives. What are you trying to accomplish? And uh, and of course, if you fire someone like that that's on the, your payroll and it's it's, it's a direct uh, subordinate of yours, you might expose yourself to some sort of unemployment claims and things like that. So that's why I'm saying you have to be careful. Third party, third party property management. If they if they do not perform, you could fire them, find another one, and that's it. Everybody goes home happy. You don't have to worry about any of that uh, of that stuff that we know that happens out there. So. Find out what your objectives are and and um, go from there. How do you incentivize tenants to take care of your units? So choosing the right tenant in the first place. So you do a very thorough background check. Make sure that you that you are um, pretty serious about your requirements. You know, three three times rent income. Um, of course, you're going to look at the other credit. And they got a pretty outstanding credit score that you know that 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 says a lot of other credibility on the type of people that they are the type of person that it is the type of tenant that it is so make sure that it has no issues with utilities uh on the credit report and make sure that they give you landlord reference and they're good references so um have requirements in place to screen the tenants uh, going back again to to doing a, a proper screening if you if you hire the the, the right tenants they they will take care of your property so and take care of them uh, at the end of the day is if you if you have a maintenance request uh take care of it diligently and and do it right you know you, you don't put a band-aid on something that requires surgery you know? so but don't don't cut corners and don't try to save uh um, a, a nickel here and, and and think that your tenants are going to take care of your property and when you're not taking care of them so be diligent on that and, and your tenants will, will actually take care of your property. So a question popped up. If you use um, a third-party management company, do you kind of give them the criteria that you're okay with for your tenants, or do you leave it completely up to them, maybe based on their experience? A lot of times it's based on their experience. Um, and, of course, we put criteria in place as well. We, we manage the asset ma the uh, property managers. We are the asset managers. Um, so it's a it's a team it's a teamwork uh, kind of thing. We we want to make sure that we bring the best tenants to our properties, and um, and that they have good systems in place to do that. To um, that, that they have a good system to screen the tenants correctly, and and there are exceptions there. It depends on the vacancy that we have. It depends on the market demand. So if we if we need to uh, fill up and and um, you know, give out some some sort of concession, or maybe you know, they when it, we have a vacancy that's uh, that's lower than 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 what we want, we want to uh, fill out the fill up the units, and let's say that they we got tenants uh, applying with good credit, they don't have the, the three times rent uh, income. Um, you know, we might reduce the um, the, the uh, deposit that they have to give. I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you could do. Um, but but it all depends on the on the specific situation of the property. So if it's a if it's a property that doesn't really that, that your vacancy is pretty pretty low, you're you're in the in, in the in the three four or five percent vacancy rate, and um, you, you could be a little bit more choosy. You know, you could be you could be a little bit more strict on on the tenants that you that, that you screen. So obviously you have a good property and and uh, and you're giving good value to your tenants. So. But if, you, if your property is 80% vacant, uh, you gotta <laughs> you gotta do something to fill it up, right? Don't go with with bad tenants either. Uh, don't just accept anything. Use good judgment. So. Thank you. All right. So, how do you find private lenders for multifamily investing? Uh, well, look to your peers. There's a lot of private money out there. I mean, uh, network with other advanced IRA people. And they do a lot of networking. Uh, you'd be surprised how much, how much private money are out there. IRA money, um, 
and and make sure that that that, that is aligned with uh, with what they're looking for, you know, with their objectives as well. Um, my number one private money is a seller, so we always, always, always ask for seller financing. That is the 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 best private money you could find. So if you're buying a property, if you're acquiring a property, always ask the seller, would they consider financing it themselves? And there is a bunch of advantages on, uh, on the seller's part to do that, um, which of course you cannot get involved into it. You can only you can only tell them consult your CPA. Uh, but we all know that when a property is sold, Uncle Sam is going to stick their hands into our pockets, right? So if they sell it, they, they, they get to know your get to know your sellers, get to get to talk to them and see what their real motivation is for for the sale, you know, and, and what do they intend to do um, without being without getting into into the business, but in, in a good way, what do they intend to do with that money? So if they're going to sell and they just going to pay a hefty capital gain taxes and and sit the rest of the money on a, on a, on a CD or on a bank savings because they have no idea what they want to do with it, well, then, then perhaps it's better that they leave it in the property, uh, finance it uh, themselves, they, own, they, they relieve a little bit of that tax liability, and they make a much better return than, than a 1% or 2% in the bank. You know, they could make a 5 or 55 or even a 6 um, if it makes sense for you as well. So have a, a, a good conversation with your sellers and have a, an honest conversation with them. And uh, and always tell them if you mention that, always tell them that they need to talk to your CPA. You want to make sure that you're not liable for uh, for any advice or anything like that. So, all right, moving on here in exit strategies. So there's a lot of exit strategies on multifamily. Um, uh, in, in our case, and a lot of my peers, operators like me, they. We, we like to refinance uh, our monies out as soon as possible, as soon as that property is stabilized and we can uh, turn around and, and give that money back to our investors, we do it. Um, if it's a property that I own myself, no investors, that I still, or joint venture or something like that, I still look into refinancing that property and taking the money that I put into it as soon as possible. Uh, whether it's year two, three, four, or five, um, that's one way of, of getting your money back, which gives you the opportunity to invest into another property. And for the most part, that property is going to be cash flowing uh, if you do it right. Um, or you can sell. You, you just you just position the property to sell. And, and for the most part, we have a business plan in place for, for the properties when we buy them. So we know the property, whether we're going to, whether, whether it's going to be a buy and hold, whether it's going to be a seven year hold or a five year hold. Um, we really don't do much less than that, uh, especially in this market cycle. Be mindful of that as well. When you are looking at a property, don't analyze the market cycle and, and which, which part of the cycle are we in and, and make sure that you on the right and you feel comfortable uh, with, with, a, with another option, with option B. So if, if your idea is to buy it, flip it and sell it in two years, well, two years might not be feasible. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe we haven't hit a recession then. But, uh, but if we do uh, hit a recession, would you be okay with holding that property longer? You know, if we if you cannot refinance it because banks are not lending, because it doesn't make sense, because we just had a an inverted year curve. So what do you do? Well, you feel comfortable with leaving your money in there and um, and holding the property a little longer until things change. So those are the questions that you have to ask yourself. Any question on that, Larissa? No, we didn't. We did have a question pop up on how to get started in multifamily investing, and so I'm going to um, change that question just a little bit so that it's not so broad. But um, maybe Ivan, you could tell us a little bit about how you got started in multifamily investing. <clears throat> so I got started in multifamily investing by investing passively in other people's deal. Uh, I I was. Uh, a single family and plexus investor. Um, we, my partner and I held a portfolio of single families in Tampa. Um, a couple of commercial properties, we still own, uh, a few commercial properties, we still own two of them, I believe, and uh, a few fourplexes. So we thought that you needed a lot of money to start something like this. And 
you know, we, we, we started to dig uh, deeper into that and we went to several trainings, we went to several seminars, we, I, um, I study a lot, I, it's, it's something that, that, I, that I do when I, uh, when I get my mind into something, I really deep, uh, dive deep into it. So when I found out that I could invest passively um, through an IRA or through other, uh, other um, uh, venues, that's, that's the first thing I, I, I did was that. So let me invest passively in multifamily investing. And um, that was my way to get in. There is, there is a bunch of other ways to get into multifamily investing. So um, this is definitely a team sport. Multifamily investing is something that you cannot do on your own. Um, even if you have a ton of money, it's something that is so complex that doing it on your own is extremely difficult. If you're going to go out there and buy a 100-unit building, uh, the, just the due diligence period, it's, it, it will consume you. So you need um, a team around you to get that done. You could, you could get involved by uh, partnering with a syndicator uh, by offering, let's say, your net worth as a sponsor. You could get, uh, you could get started with liquidity. Uh, a lot of times the, the banks require, especially if it's agency debt, uh, agency financing, which is done through Fannie Mae and, uh, and Freddie Mac, uh, they require uh, some type of liquidity for the day-to-day -day operations of the, build, of the, uh, of the business. Um, so if you have the liquidity, uh, you, could, you could partner. Um, if you bring the deal, if you find, if you find a, 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 you have a friend that has 40 units and you have no idea how to look at those numbers, how to own the writing, you know, how do I do this, you know, how, where do I go? Well, you found the deal, right? So you, you partner with someone that does, you partner with an operator, uh, with a syndicator, and they could own the right the properties. They, they, they could tell you whether the numbers make sense or not and tell you, or tell you what, the, uh, what the offer price could be and, and help you with that part. And then you could be part of that uh, general partnership or joint venture. So there's, a, there's endless, well, not, not endless, but there's, there's six or seven different ways of getting started with it. And of course, being a passive investor gets you involved into, into the multifamily investing uh, nowadays. So. Thank you. And then also um, kind of adding on to that, how do you find the opportunities? Um, you know, are you doing mailings? Is it, you know, networking? How is it that you're finding the opportunities that you'd like to invest in? All of, all of the above. But we, we do a lot of um, cold calling and we do a lot of uh, mails. We, we send straight to mails, straight to owners. Um, we go into the public records and we try to find uh, all the information that we could on the, on the owners of the property that we're targeting, and we send them letters. Um, if we can find the numbers, we give them a call and, and tell them that we have an interest in buying the property. So we also create um, you know relationships with with uh, brokers. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, bird dogs out there. I don't know if you're familiar with the terms, but uh, you know wholesalers per se, uh, people that, that that that's that's what they do. They they're they're on the street looking for property. So. We have a few of those that, that we have told in our parameters what we look for, and uh, and they send us properties uh, every now and then. They send us a property, and so there's many ways. And, and of course, um, networking is a it's a it's a great way of doing it. You get involved in the community, go out there, and um, this is another way to find it. I had another question pop up about um, incentivizing the property managers to keep the units full. Is there a way to do that? For example, the manager the manager is paid only when the unit is rented, or is there any way to do that? Yes, the usually the leasing agents get uh, get bonuses based on the on the units that they lease and how quickly they turn them around. So if they if, if they're able to turn them around quickly uh, in a week, let's say, um, you know, but we have a structure, which I don't know on top of my mind right now what the structure is, but we have a structure um, that we compensate them based on how quickly you can turn that unit around. So if that unit uh, sits there for a month or, uh, or two months, then of course it's, it's, they're not going to get paid as, as, as the, the bonus is not going to be as nice as if it sits there for a week and you're able to sell it and, 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 and rent it right, you know, right away. So we, we give them a little bit more uh, compensation for doing that. Okay. 
Um, and I had another question pop up, and I just want to remind everybody, because we're really at the end of the webinar here, if you do have any last-minute questions, go ahead and type them into the question box. We'll try to get them answered for you. Um, the last one I have here is, what criteria are you looking for when finding properties in the public record? We're, we're looking for the, um, the unit size. Um, we're looking at the location of the property. We um, we have other we have other systems that we use uh, to see when when the property was purchased last. Uh, we look at um, who owns it, whether it's a person or whether it's a you know a corporation. We do some research on that. Um, you know, when's the last time they when, when was the last sale date of that of that property? If that property was purchased last year, then we're probably going to skip skip that one and, and go to the next one because uh, what are the chances that they're going to want to sell it this year? And if they do, the price is going to be a little bit over what we target. So um, we're looking for properties that haven't been traded in in, in 10 years uh, you know, or more or nine or eight years, something like that. But we don't want a property that has been traded uh, too, too recently because the, the price is going to be, uh, because of the hot market that we're in right now, the price is going to be a little bit higher than, than what we want to pay. Um, so that this, 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 those are some of the stuff that we look at. Okay, thanks, Ivan. And with that, I don't see any other questions. So I just want to thank you so much for joining us. And um, thank you, everybody who logged in. And um, you will get a copy of the recording once it's available. You'll also be able to check it out on YouTube. Did you want to add anything? Ivan, you want to mention your uh, meetup group again? Yes, we, we hold a meetup on Joe's uh, Crab Shack over in uh, Clearwater by uh, the Toronto 60. So it's the third when, uh, Thursday of every month. Exception is this month uh, coming up. We're going to do it on the Wednesday, I believe, and I'm about to announce that. It's called Wealth and Passive Income uh, through Multifamily Investing. Uh, find me on, on, on meetup.com. And this one coming up, we're going to discuss a live deal that we have right now on the contract. We're going to go through every single detail of that deal, uh, which is a mobile home park that we have on the contract. We're going to discuss the due diligence process how we found it, everything. We're going to discuss everything there. So if you want to get a little bit educated on that on that uh, part, you're welcome to join us. Um, I will announce it and, and just find the meetup on meetup.com and I will announce the date and the, uh, and the time. Usually it's from 6 to 8 um, and it will be a, for Wednesday, the, uh, I believe it's the 16th uh, or the 15th of this month coming up. Okay, right. and um, what's the name of the group on meetup one more time? It's it's called Wealth and Passive Income through Multifamily Investing. Okay, perfect. All Hopefully. right. Well, thank you so much, Ivan, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you so much for having me, Larissa. Absolutely. Take care. Take care.